This is Pulse 95. Pulse 95. It's the Morning Majlis. It's the Morning Majlis. Good morning and welcome back on to the Morning Majlis. We had the big hype yesterday. What was it all about? What was going on? It was the Mars Orbit insertion. What's the biggest deal? Why are we doing this? Well, the Hope Probe is looking at the idea of human colonization of Mars. They, they're up there to investigate what's uh, happening to uh, Mars, the red planets, and why is it, and what can be, what has been changing its atmospheric conditions. It's all going to be studying that and it's going to be there for a very long time. So what's happened now is it is arrived into orbit, so it was a breaking point. It was a critical mm. phase. The probe was self-programmed to, and it was tested million times uh, to to get used to the Mars orbit insertion. So now uh, it's been a work in six years uh, and uh, now it was up there. So what the hype was all about that we saw yesterday, the 27 minutes, was the braking. Uh, so it was moving from 120,000 kilometers an hour down to 18,000 kilometers an hour. Now the probe is going to get used to the orbit. So there's going to be a lot of um, work is still ongoing so that it can refix itself and then start transmitting data uh, before the beginning of what they call the science phase, which kicks off in April 2021. I'll tell you more about it, uh, but for the time being, we've gone through the, the most difficult phase. That's where most of the failures have happened, but now the United Arab Emirates is in the elite list of nations to have done so. Definitely history was made. The UAE has officially become the first Arab nation and fifth in the world to reach Mars after the Hope Probe successfully entered the red planet's orbit at 7.42 p.m. Now, let's take you back a little bit of what happened yesterday. If you weren't watching, I, I doubt anybody wasn't watching, but if you were not watching, I'll take you back through the moments that this 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 was announced um, in at the Burj Plaza of Mohammed bin Rashid Boulevard, where a giant display screen live streamed the scenes at the MR, at the uh, uh, the MBRSC ground station. The most tense moment was when Umran Sharaf was seen speaking to somebody on the phone, probably one from the Deep Space Network in Madrid, Spain. At one moment, he and his engine engineers they smiled. And that was it. Hmm. The signal that indicated the UAE had made it successfully into the orbit, accomplishing just another daring feat since the time of Hope's launch on July 20th of 2020. Now, everyone present at the plaza rose for a standing ovation with people smiling from ear to ear. Now, congratulating messages, uh, again, were sounding out aloud and silent prayers of gratitude were being sent out to the Almighty. Um, as for our president, His Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan, he hailed, uh, His Highness hailed the breakthrough. He said this historic achievement would not have been possible without the persistence and determination to implement the idea that emerged at the end of 2013 by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President and Prime Minister of UAE and also ruler of Dubai who followed it up closely until its success. He also praised the efforts of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces in dedicating all kinds of support needed to make the dream come true as well. Yeah, what an incredible moment. And we've seen quite the buildup for this over the past few days. A lot of enthusiasm for hope and for the UAE's space exploration aspirations. We've seen public monuments, buildings and heritage sites across the country all light up in red. And yesterday we had the Burj Khalifa as well uh, light up and flash a countdown to the big mo moment uh, where the hope entered the orbit. Mm. This is a major win for the UAE and its journey uh, to go to the stars started seven years ago with the hopes of inspiring the next generation. Her Excellency Sara Lamiri, UAE Minister of State for Advanced Technology and Chair of the UAE Space Agency, she, she said, I'm really grateful. It's like a weight of seven years has been lifted from my shoulder. On arriving at Mars, I'm now truly looking forward to the scientific discoveries and I truly hope this mission will impact an entire generation to strive to do things that are even bigger. And now the scientific work has yet mm. to uh, has 
about to start now uh, to study the atmosphere of Mars and how dust particles uh, are emitted by the planet and land elsewhere as well. So that's going to be very, very exciting stuff from a scientific point of view. That's right. And the complex maneuver that put probe into the Martian orbit involves reversing the spacecraft and firing its six thrusters in a 27-minute burn to rapidly decelerate the spacecraft. So as you mentioned, Ahmed, now that it has entered the Martian orbit, the probe will transition to the science phase, transmitting its first image of Mars back to Earth within just one week. So we just got to yeah. wait and see. So now the big question is now what? Now it's up there, what's going to happen? So it's going to take about 45 days for it to be uh, rebooted, the systems to find, uh, put itself in a very correct position to collect, transmit data. Uh, it is going to be the first ever planet-wide 24 by 7 picture of Mars's atmospheric dynamics and the weather daily updates. And uh, we will also see that they, the three science in instruments that are installed on the probe uh, will collect about 1,000 GB of uh, comprehensive of new Martian data that has never been collected before and it is also going to look at uh, understanding the geographic and clim uh, climatic changes uh, especially when it comes to those uh, dust storms and just paving the way should human colonization take place or not who knows uh, but this is going to uh, be up there so there is the probe is not going to land in Mars because there's no humans on board the probe to walk around Mars. So it's just going to be circulating uh, the uh, the orbit and it is going to be collecting that all important data for one full Martian year, uh, which is for over 600 days. So it's going to be two years that is going to be up there. So a very, very important occasion, a very, very important milestone. No, a no first Arab country to do so. So that's why we're all celebrating and excited for it. And that's why we leave you with those excitements. Uh, we'll be back again after the news headlines and we'll continue the discussions here on the Morning Majlis right after that. Stay tuned to Pulse 95. Pulse 95. 95. Between local lines. Notes from the Emirate. Well, we're definitely excited for today's Exposure International Photography Festival. It will be opening today at 11.30 for the public until 10 p.m. and is going for four days. So it's a four-day festival of celebrating photography basically mm. and it's going to be bringing it's going to be bringing the world's best photographers to you to expo center Sharjah. so the timings uh, they will be today from 11 30 a.m until 10 p.m tomorrow they'll be from 11 until 10 uh friday will be from 2 p.m until 11 p.m and saturday it will be from 11 a.m until 10 p.m but let's lo look at the measures that have been taken ahead of the opening of the fifth annual edition of the exposure international photography festival today an official committee uh, from National Emergency Crisis and Disaster Management Authority in Sharjah, they have concluded uh, a detailed venue inspection visit confirming that festival preparations are in strict adherence with the UAE's health and safety guidelines to curb the spread of the coronavirus. And the committee was taken around the over 18,000 square meter venue by His Excellency Tariq Saeed Alai, director of the Sharjah Government Media Bureau, during which he briefed them on all precautionary measures being undertaken to ensure that participating photographers, visitors, guests, and also members of media can navigate the festival in a safe and worthy free matter. Certainly, Rania. And uh, looking at what they're doing at the uh, Sharjah Expo Center, they're creating a limit on the number of visitors at any given time. So the cap for the venue at the moment is 2,000 people. Also within workshops, participants are restricted to 20 people at a time. There will be temperature checks at all entry points, as well as detailed cleaning procedures and strict social distancing protocols being employed. Now, His Excellency Tariq Saeed Alai, director of the Sharjah Government Media Bureau, said that the National Emergency Crisis and Disaster Management Authority's recognition of the festival's commitment and protocols that seek to offer a safe environment is already a feather in exposure's cap even before it has begun. It also communicates a message of art and photography to enthusiasts in the UAE and the region about the importance of following the festival's safety procedures and precautionary measures. So they're quite confident about the safety measures uh, being employed here at the Expo Center. 
Absolutely, and there will be so many workshops today that we'll we'll talk about later on from 11 to 1 because I will be co-hosting co- um, the live coverage with Aisha Mazmi and uh, um, and Hani Balqis as well. So we'll go we'll, we'll be going from 11 until 1, and we'll be talking about all the workshops. There will be three workshops today, starting from 12 p.m. The first one is called Focal Length Explained. The second one will be at 2. It's called Creating Wow Factor in landscape photography with Ilya Locardi. The third one will be at five and it's called Photo Alchemy. So mm. make sure to check them out to register yourself. Go go over to exposure.ae, register yourself in the workshops, in the exhibition or in the festival itself. And also stay tuned with us from 11 to 1 because we will be keeping you updated with everything that's happening in the festival. And we have so many exciting interviews that we'll be also conducting with photographers and prominent figures as well. Yeah, going to tune into that as well, figure out what's happening, this exposure. And uh, later on in the show, we'll be talking in more detail about workshops and sessions to attend at the festival. There is so much to do and so much to take in as well. But I'm happy, Rania, you'll be on the air with us today to walk us through this. I am too. I'm so excited. Yeah, we look forward to it. It's going to be brilliant. Uh, So stay tuned to Pulse 95. We've got more stories coming up just after the sports headlines. Uh, We'll be talking about the investigation of the World Health Organization in China on the origins of COVID-19. Stay tuned. Pulse 95. The Morning Majlis. Talking the stories that are shaping headlines. This is is Pulse 95. Well, a year into the pandemic, the origins of the coronavirus, they're still a mystery. Uh, the, that's why the, the World Health Organization, they sent an international team to Wuhan, China in January to investigate where the virus came from and how it was introduced into our world or the human population. Yet the investigation kind of yielded few definitive answers. The experts were able to take one hypothesis off the table, however, the idea that the novel coronavirus may have accidentally leaked from a Wuhan lab. Now, this theory was pushed by some members, of, of course, of the uh, Trump administration in the, in the spring, and we saw that it was very clear. But Peter Ben, who is the World Health Organization's food safety and animal disease specialist, he said in a Tuesday press conference that a lab leak is extremely unlikely to explain the introduction of the virus into the human population. And the WHO team will not be revisiting that hypothesis in future studies, he said, adding that the virus most likely jumped from an animal host into people just like Ebola and SARS did in the past. Now, working together with Chinese scientists, the WHO uh, experts had kind of unfettered access to um, key places in Wuhan over four weeks, including hospitals, laboratories, and also the, uh, the, the, the seafood market, which was linked to the first known cluster of COVID-19 cases. And those who had suggested that possibility of a lab leak mostly pointed to the Wuhan Institute of Virology since some scientists there study coronaviruses. And it was one of the highest level of biosafety labs in the world. So there's no evidence, however, that any coronavirus sample collected for study in that lab was accidentally released. Yeah, and that's a major finding as well because uh, the notion that the virus leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology was pushed heavily by the Donald Trump administration. That was the accusation they had levied at China uh, throughout uh, Trump's presidency and during the COVID-19 pandemic. So it points to how fraught this situation is, how highly politicized the investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 in China are. Uh, Now, what the expert group has said so far is they are positing that the virus may have jumped from animals to humans but they don't have proof yet. Possible carriers include bats and pangolins, but tests so far have yet to find convincing evidence for this. Another line of investigation is whether the virus could have spread through imported frozen food. But as of now, the hunt for the origin will continue. This is a particularly difficult uh, thing amid this climate right now because we've seen a lot of very odd theories uh, circulating on social media and going viral notably a video of a woman eating bat soup uh, but turned out that video was from palau not china and uh, no evidence of that being a a possibility if the virus would have jumped from animals to humans a scientist said it could have happened through livestock an intermediary animal possibly between bats and humans but again the investigation is still ongoing and they haven't determined the right answer but uh, already 
the United States uh, rejecting the notion uh, uh, that the investigation uh, does not need U.S. monitoring right now. They said uh, they need to inden- independently verify what the WHO team is doing in China. And I think this sheds further light into how highly politicized this mission is. It appears so. Uh, and uh, what's happening at the moment is uh, that the, the visit, of course, is being monitored uh, by the host authorities for sure. And by looking at the international response to the, uh, the investigation is New York Times with a big headline says China scores a PR win after the WHO mission. Um, look, it's going to be very interesting to see what they come up with and unearth because at the moment they've been going into this uh, uh, to, to the market and saying it might have been from the frozen and food. A lot of analysts are saying that it's now going to be a diver- uh, diverting attention away from what it should have been because what now they're going to be looking at is supply chains and looking elsewhere uh, and it is quite dangerous uh, especially when it comes to uh, shifting the focus elsewhere um, and uh, the Chinese ambassador to the United States was recently suggested that the US should also allow the WHO to send investigators there as part of its inquiry. Chinese officials have also promoted the idea that the virus came from abroad at their recent news conference, arguing that the search for the origin of the virus should be focused on places outside of China. The investigation will not be restricted to any location, uh, who has been leading the team of Chinese scientists assisting in the WHO mission. Um, So the questions that we're all facing at the moment is, then where did it originate from? What is the narrative and where is the virus coming from? Whilst we're also focusing on the new variants that are emerging and and causing distress and uh, and more concerns to us general public. Indeed, uh, Abdul Karim, and uh, it's quite tricky as well uh, for the United States uh, weighing in on the WHO investigation now that it had left Uh, the organization as well. Uh, Joe Biden had made it clear that they intend on rejoining the WHO and uh, being more of an active uh, participant uh, during this process. Uh, However, uh, as far as Joe Biden towing the line on China at the moment, he has also uh, expressed uh, concern about this investigation. So you could certainly see uh, the geopolitics shaping up in the backdrop of this. So uh, this is a situation to be monitored. Uh, China's line is that the virus may have originated elsewhere. They say Italy tested positive for COVID-19 in November 2019. So there's a dermatological Italian patient zero as well. That's a possibility they had been uh, pushing. uh, But uh, like I said earlier, highly politicized situation. Everybody's got some say in the matter. Mm. Everybody's got some theory they're trying to push and posit. And uh, it's up to the World Health Organization investigators to find an objective and scientific answer to where exactly this thing originated. Yep, of course. And uh, the issue is the inquiry is still in its early stages. It could take years. And uh, the WHO officials have promised a more rigorous and transparent examination of data and research by China and other countries. Uh, So we'll have to see what happens uh, after this. But uh, for the time being, what we do know is that the WHO team has been looking at uh, uh, at, at posting a lot on social media and posting those interviews and questions that they have with uh, the the team, with with the public, general public that they've been uh, meeting in China uh, as part of uh, suggesting their transparency. Stay with us on the Morning Majlis. Up next is the big announcement. The big nerve-wracking, maybe a bit of goosebumps as well, is the successful uh, Mars orbit insertion of the Hope Probe. What does that mean now that they have managed to get in? Uh, And uh, we'll keep you posted about what it all all means and what's going to happen next. So stay with us on the Morning Majlis as we break it down for you and explain to you in greater detail what this all fuss is all about. Stay with us. This is The Morning Majlis on Pulse95. Pulse95. 95. The Morning Majlis. Talking the stories that are shaping headlines. This is, this is Pulse95. 95. This is Pulse95 95 and uh, we did uh, have a very tragic start to the year and uh, the year 2020 and we saw the the demise of uh, our very very uh, much beloved uh, basketball legend and star uh, Kobe Bryant now the National Transport Safety Board which normally uh, assesses and evaluates and investigates aircraft uh, crashes uh, they've 
released their findings and they've said the pilot who crashed uh, the helicopter carrying Kobe Bryant killing all nine made a series of poor decisions that led him to fly blindly into a wall of clouds where he became so disorientated that he thought he was climbing when the craft was plunging towards a Southern California hillside as according to the statement by the federal safety officials. The uh, uh, board uh, blamed a pilot, Ara Zubayan, in, on the 26th of January 2020 crash that killed him along with Bryant and the basketball star's daughter and six other passengers uh, heading to a girls' basketball tournament. But he was an experienced pilot. Was an experienced pilot indeed and uh, quite baffling that he wound up in this uh, situation. And... Uh, Investigators are saying that the pilot may have felt this sense of pressure to complete the flight for Kobe Bryant and that that might have been a contributing cause. Now, following the investigation, uh, federal investigators are recommending significant helicopter safety changes, including more pilot training and readily available technology. But what they came away with is that this incident was entirely preventable and that pilot Ara Zubayan was essentially pushing the limits of bad weather flying rules, climbing into clouds, getting disoriented about the helicopter's position and making a descending left turn into a Calabasas, California hillside. Uh, now, the chairman uh, in charge of the federal investigation said, quote, even good pilots can end up in bad situations. Pilot really wanted to go where he was going, and an accident is just something that's unforeseen, unpredictable, if you will. Unfortunately, this accident wasn't. Yeah, it's just it's, it's very it, very annoying for us to find out as well, and especially when it, it was in the 40-minute flight as well, and when he did decide to climb above the clouds, he entered a trap that has doomed many flights. Once a pilot loses visual cues by flying into fog or darkness, the inner ear can send weird signals to the brain that causes uh, a spatial disorientation. It's sometimes known as the leans, causing pilots to believe they're flying aircraft straight and level when they're banking. Uh, flight under the visual flight rules. Uh, uh, Zubayan was required to be able to see where he was going. Flying into the cloud was a violation of that standard and probably led to his disorientation. That's according to NTSB. Uh, and according to the investigations, the Sikorsky S-76B helicopter was flying at about 184 miles an hour and descending at a rate of more than 4,000 feet per minute when it slammed into the hillside and ignited. That's uh, that's very quick. And looking based on that speed, based on, on the, the descent, the chances of survival were very slim anyway. They were indeed. And uh, investigators also criticized the pilot for banking the helicopter to the left instead of bringing the aircraft straight up. A lot of odd decisions especially considering the pilot was experienced. He had often flown for Kobe Bryant and had even logged more than 1,200 hours in the Sikorsky 76 helicopter. Investigators saying that the close relationship between Bryant and Zubayan may have compelled the pilot to fly despite these conditions. And uh, in text messages on the eve of the crash, uh, the pilot had written that the forecast seemed to, quote, not be the best. And uh, the next morning wrote that conditions were looking okay, but he wasn't too comfortable about the situation. Still flew, still made those decisions, and uh, quite the tragedy there because uh, aside from the passing of NBA legend Bryant and 13-year-old daughter Gianna, there were nine total uh, di who died and were killed uh, during this crash. Yeah, what a tragic start it was. I think that, that, that was the... If you think back to uh, the start of the pandemic, that really was it because we were seeing concerns and suddenly we were greeted with this uh, uh, tragedy and uh, we were still reeling from the effects of it that the pandemic 
really, really gathered strength and uh, took away all of the attention. But now the NTSB has come to a conclusion and they've ruled it out as a pilot error in causing of that crash. Well, stay with us here on the Morning Majlis. We shall take a bit of a break and uh, when we do return, we'll continue the focus on the exposure and what's happening over there. So stay tuned to Pulse 95 and uh, we shall be right back after a bit of a short break. Stay tuned to Pulse 95. Entertainment headlines. Entertainment headlines. Entertainment headlines. This is... This is... The Buzz. This is The Buzz. Let's talk movies because uh, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences has announced the shortlist for its upcoming Oscars. Categories have been defined, movies have been nominated, and there'll be plenty of documentaries, international features, and animated films as well uh, that have been shortlisted for the Oscars. So a lot of hype uh, going into this. Uh, The shortlist voting had concluded earlier this week, and uh, there'll be more phases of the voting to try and tighten that shortlist even more. Uh, Phase 1 voting is set to take place on March 5th to the 9th, And the Oscar nominations will be announced on March 15, with a show scheduled to take place on April 25. Yeah, uh, it's it's incredible, isn't it, Um, that it's all coming uh, back to life for the world of uh, entertainment business and the awards season whenever they come in. That's uh, when you know that uh, it, it is... Uh, that that is something to look forward to for sure. Now, which f- songs and films have made the cut? The 15 films were uh, highlighted from 238 eligible titles. Academy Award nominations will be announced on uh, Monday, 15th of March. And uh, what we do know is... Um, a couple of big films that made the cuts for it as well. Romania's Collective is also one of the 15 films for the international feature uh, that then you have uh, uh, The Two of Us by France. Denmark's Another Round is, is also in there. A um, couple of other film documentaries. This is my favorite category. Mm, yeah. Uh, and it's The Collective and uh, uh, Milk and FBI, Netflix's Crip Cramp, and Dick Johnson is dead were amongst the few that have been uh, highlighted and and put forward. Yeah, quite the diverse uh, offerings, Abdul Karim. Uh, What I'm really excited about is the fact that there's going to be a movie out of Sudan that's also in the running for uh, Best International Feature Film. It's called You Will Die at 20. Notably, the first feature film made in Sudan in 20 years. Its director, Amjad Abu Alala, saying, I wanted to see how stories can be told in Sudan because it's a very unique country and Sudan is the heart of Africa. So there you go. Sudan has its first ever Academy Awards entry and uh, really exciting and wish them the best. Yeah, we do, certainly. And we're looking forward uh, to this. uh, The the Oscars taking place. Winners will be announced at the 93rd Oscars ceremony on Sunday, April 25. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully with the vaccine drive that is ongoing, uh, it will be a a live in-person event. So let's see and look forward to that indeed. So uh, we're really, really hoping that this could uh, get uh, more traction and uh, we see some really good films being celebrated as well. Absolutely. I got my eyes on the Tom Hanks movie, News of the World. I think that one's probably going to be snagging a couple of awards as well. It's about a Civil War veteran, travels from town to town, relaying the news of the day and agrees to take an orphaned young girl to her only remaining family. And that's a, a movie that's uh, been gaining quite some traction as well. Uh, Tom Hanks is quite the headliner. And uh, this movie, uh, in fact, is beginning its streaming on Netflix today. So you could check Whoa. it out there. Yep. That's going to be that. I've got my weekend plan sorted now. <laughs> I was hoping to find a film, to be honest. And look, Tom Hanks is such a brilliant actor. And he, this film is also quite interesting because uh, I think in, during the production of it, he contracted the virus uh, COVID-19. He was amongst the very first few film actors and celebrities to have contracted COVID-19. And uh, he luckily he did survive. But uh, yes, so much to discuss and so much to look forward to indeed with this uh, new film. But... For the time being, us at the Morning Majlis, we will take a long break and we'll be back again tomorrow bright and early. But in a few, maybe in an hour's time, 11 a.m., we have our own team taking the airwaves from exposure. 
That's right. Uh, we'll be passing the baton uh, because at 11 o'clock, that's where our Pulse 95 live broadcast at the Exposure International Photography Festival will take place. Aisha Mazmi, our own Rania Saadi, and Hani Balqis will be there to walk you through this event, discuss the upcoming workshops and sessions and happenings, and also conduct interviews with participants and uh, organizers alike. So uh, it's all about the passion and love for photography, and now uh, we look forward to talking to that uh, or talking about that uh, with you later on today. Thank you all for tuning in to today's show. If you'd like to listen uh, to today's podcast, uh, if you've missed any of our discussions, we're on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Just type in Morning Majlis in the search bar. Thank you for tuning in. Stay safe and stay tuned to Pulse 95. If you liked this episode of the Morning Majlis, drop a like and subscribe. 95. Be sure to follow us on Instagram for all our daily updates and top stories. Bubbles.